Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, so today we're going to talk about anchoring vignettes um, and what anchoring vignettes will do is correct for interpersonally incomparable um, survey responses. You ask survey questions, different people interpret them to mean different things. To put it in context, let's think about this. So <clears throat> there are certain skills out there that are perfectly clear. You can't just try a little bit of. You have to really get the hang of it. Like you're not going to fly a jet fighter just for a few minutes. You got to get a lot of expertise. Or if you're not feeling well at dinner and you think there's something wrong, you don't ask to, someone to pass a steak knife and you fi fix a heart problem. If you're going to be a heart surgeon, you, you got go to go to school for it. Survey research requires every bit as much expertise as heart surgery and flying jet fighters. But it doesn't seem that way. It's one of these things that it feels like you can just try a little bit without any expertise at all. It is totally wrong. Survey research feels like you can write a question and you just write it clearly so that everybody can understand. You write it clearly so that everybody can understand the same way. You know, concretely, you know, like maybe you'll think about it really hardly, hard. Uh-uh. Survey research is really hard. It requires tremendous expertise. If you think you can write a survey question that's very clear that everybody, everybody can understand, how come you have massive misunderstandings with people you've known for 20 or 30 years, but yet you expect that you're going to write a question and it's going to be delivered by um, people on telephones, maybe a whole bank of people on telephones who you've never met, calling up people anonymously or knocking on their doors and asking them a question you wrote three weeks earlier, and there's not going to be any misunderstandings? That's completely ridiculous. We have to deal with this. We have to deal with the problem of interpersonal incomparability. Sometimes it's just because you worded the question badly. Sometimes you worded the question very well if they understand what's in your head, but they don't understand what's in your head. Sometimes there's cultural differences in how words are interpreted. Sometimes there are, um, <clears throat> there are gender differences or racial differences. Um, th these are really important questions, and if you blow this, you blow the contribution of survey research, which in itself is probably the biggest um, contribution, methodological contribution to the social sciences in the, in the last century, I think I've said earlier in these, in these slides. So today we're going to talk about a technique for dealing with interpersonal incomparability. It's also going to enable us to illustrate all of the stages or many of the stages that we've gone through in these slides before today. Um, so we'll build a statistical model. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll write down likelihood functions for it. It'll be a multiple equation model. It'll be identified only because of the multiple equation aspects of the model. Um, uh, it will solve an important problem. It will enable us to go after substantive questions in much more depth and uh, enable us to understand substantive problems much, much better. Um, so, so, so um, uh, anchoring vignettes for interpersonally incomparable survey responses. Let's get started. All right, so we have um, an introduction. We're going to talk about uh, uh, a non-parametric method for correcting for this problem, a parametric method, and then some, some illustrations. Okay, um, <clears throat> so um, for some readings, um, this was the first paper. It was in the American Political Science Review in 2004 <clears throat> by my friends uh, Chris Murray. Uh, he runs uh, IHME now. Um, Josh Solomon, who's a professor at Stanford, and A.J. Tandon, who is at the World Health Organization. <clears throat> There's another paper by Jonathan Wand, who is a terrific postdoc here. Uh, <clears throat> um, and uh, another paper with Dan Hopkins, who um, is, is a uh, professor at Penn. <clears throat> um, these, are, these are the articles, and um, there's also a report from the National Research Council um, on um, <clears throat> uh, privacy in the information age, and they use the idea of anchoring vignettes not, for, not to conduct surveys, but to understand complicated uh, concepts that you can't um, understand other ways. Turns out, this same technology that corrects for interpersonally incomparable surveys can also be used for that purpose. Um, so let's just outline the two, the two problems that this addresses, because they're very different. Um, <clears throat> so the first problem that anchoring vignettes addresses, and I'll describe what anchoring vi vignettes are afterwards, um, <clears throat> are um, uh, big concepts that you can only define by example. 
Um, freedom, efficacy, pornography, you know it when you see it, health, legislative compactness, democracy, intelligence. Um, the usual advice that you give people when they say, I don't really know how to measure this very well, it's a big complicated concept, is you say, you don't have a methodological problem, you have a theoretical problem, go get a theory and then you'll know what to measure. Well, it turns out that doesn't work very well because what happens is they come up with a very precise theory which produces a very precise and concrete measure which is more reliable because you can measure the same, the, the same, you can measure it again and get the same answer. But it doesn't give you any more validity. What you want is a, is a measure that, that is a measure of this big complicated concept and that's really hard to do. Uh, anchoring in vignettes will help you do it. Second, anchoring vignettes will also help you with intercomparability in survey responses. We'll call that DIF, differential item functioning. That comes from uh, education, where item is the survey question, and differential functioning means that different people interpret it in different ways. In different fields, they call this um, different things, but it's just a convenient name for problem we go, we're going to fix, so we'll call it DIF. Um, so some examples are um, the Chinese, when you do a survey, and we did a survey, and I'll show you the survey, report having more political efficacy, more say in government uh, than Americans and, and, and Mexicans, as the example is that, that we'll show you. Um, the most common measure of health, how healthy are you, excellent, good, fair, and poor, often correlates negatively with actual health. Amartya Sen has a great example of this from in India. Um, Ethiopians and Danes report being equally healthy. It's very nice that they report that, but it ain't accurate. <laughs> um, uh, and the big problem is individuals understand the same survey questions in vastly different ways. Okay, so let me give you um, an example of anchoring vignettes, in particular vignettes or survey questions, that we'll use to solve these problems. Um, and so here's the, here's the question. We actually use this in the field in 80 different countries. Uh, and actually it's been replicated in lots, lots of others. So here's the question. How much say do you have in getting the government to address issues that interest you? Unlimited say, a lot of say, some say, little say, or no say at all. So that's called political efficacy, say, say in government. So how much say do you have in getting the government to address issues that interest you? So that's the self-assessment question. In addition, what anchoring vignettes do is they ask you about, not you, not only you, but also about a hypothetical person. So for example, <clears throat> Allison, um, which we contrived, uh, Allison lacks clean drinking water. She and her neighbors are supporting an opposition candidate in the forthcoming elections that has promised to address the issue. It appears so many people in her area feel the same way that the opposition candidate will defeat the incumbent representative. So Allison obviously has lots of political efficacy. Then there's Jane, and you can read that one if you like, if you want to pause uh, the, the slide. And then there's, there, and Jane has less political efficacy. Then I'm going to go down to Moses, who has even less political efficacy. Moses lacks clean drinking water. He would like to change this, but he can't vote and feels that no one in the government cares about this issue. So he suffers in silence. Remember Moses suffering in silence, because I'm going to come back to him. So he suffers in silence, hoping something will be done in the future. So Moses clearly has very, very little political efficacy. So we have these three um, vignettes, these three hypothetical people, Alice and Jane and Moses, they have different levels of political efficacy. We're going to ask the self-assessment question, which is the thing we care about. We want to measure your political efficacy, but we're also going to ask these vignette questions. And I'm going to use the vignettes in a particular way to correct the self-assessment question. So I'm going to show you how to do that non-parametrically and then parametrically. Okay, so first our non-parametric method. <clears throat> um, all right, so we're gonna illustrate two respondents. On the left-hand side, we have one respondent, so that's R1. <clears throat> um, we imagine a scale that goes from low political efficacy to high, and Allison, of course, has the highest political efficacy than Jane, than Moses. We asked respondent one the, the, um, how much political efficacy Allison has, and respondent one reported here. We then reported, we then asked Allison, we then asked respondent one, how much political efficacy Jane has? And they, they give an answer here, and then Moses down here. Now they didn't actually have a slider on this bar because we, we actually had 
a survey question, and the survey question, um, the answers were unlimited, some, you know, et cetera. So they were discrete. But nevertheless, we can, can, we can imagine it this way. Then we asked the question we actually cared about, which is how much political efficacy, how much say in government do you have? And that's where respondent one puts him or herself. They put himself right here. Okay. Now think about respondent two. Respondent two reports having a lower level of political efficacy because he or she puts himself here. Remember, respondent one is here, respondent two is here. Respondent two answers the vignette questions in different ways. There's Alice and Jane and Moses. He, he orders them in the same way, but, but answers them in different ways, puts them in different levels. <clears throat> okay, how are we gonna compare these two? Does respondent two have lower political efficacy than respondent one or not? So if we just take the usual survey questions and we take the answers to the usual survey questions and, <clears throat> and uh, compare the two, obviously respondent one reports having less political efficacy than that more political efficacy, efficacy than respondent two. <clears throat> However, we have these vignettes and we suspect interpersonal incomparability, different views as to what the question means. How are we gonna figure that out? What we do is we say, you know what, Allison is the same Allison as over here. Even though, even though respondent two judged Allison to have a lower level of political efficacy than respondent one, it's the same Allison. So what we should do is take the second scale here and stretch it out as, as we have on the right to match the first scale. So Allison here matches Allison here, Jane matches Jane, and Moses matches Moses. So you can think of the second um, respondent on a scale, on a rubber band scale that we can stretch until the vignettes match. And as, the, as we stretch it so the vignettes match, it pulls up the self-assessment to the right point so it is now interpersonally comparable between respondent one and respondent two. And we see that respondent two has more political efficacy than respondent one. That's how anchoring vignettes work in an intuitive way. We have to figure out how it works in a statistical way, okay? So um, just a little quiz, just to help make sure that you, you understand what's going on. Uh, what does the varying vignettes assessments tell us, okay? Like what does it convey to us? Well, it conveys to us diff. It conveys to us that different people, different respondents, these two different respondents are interpreting the questions in different ways. Okay, that, that is useful methodologically because we can use it to construct an answer, to correct the answer. But it is also useful substantively. Understanding that different respondents interpret questions in different ways, that's a behavioral or opinion or, um, uh, or a conceptual or, or um, an interpretive difference among people. And that's what we study. So it's, it's actually quite valuable to understand that. Um, all right, so another, another good question is, how do uh, we know the true assessments are fixed over the respondents, right? Maybe actually the truth about these, these hypothetical vignettes differ. Well, the reason why is because we created Alice and Jane and Moses, right? They are actually the same people. They might be interpreted differently by the different respondents, but the actual true level of efficacy of Jane, Moses, and, and Allison, they're the same across respondents. By assumption, to be fair, but we created those things. Your political efficacy, my political efficacy, we may differ among each other, but it's not reasonable to say that Allison differs across respondents because Allison is the same Allison. Okay, let's formalize this logic, <clears throat> this intuitive logic, in a more formal, uh, non-parametric methodology. Okay, so we'll define the self-assessment questions relative to the vignette questions, just as we did in the previous slide. <clears throat> um, here's, what it, here's what it looks like. So we have a bunch of, bunch of vignette questions, the answers to which we're gonna call Z1, Z2, Z3 on up. Um, we're gonna call C our, correct, our corrected measure. And if, Z, if, if your answer, which is Y, you know, this, my, the respondent's answer is gonna be Y, the respondent's answer to the self-assessment self question, the respondent's answer to the vignette are going to be Z1, Z2, Z3. If Y is less than all the Zs, um, right, less than Z1, let's suppose the, the respondent gives uh, ordered answers to the vignette questions, as we would expect, but, the, but gives a, a self-assessment lower than all the Zs, that's category one. If it's equal to the first Z, 
that's category two. If it's between the, the first two vignettes, it's category three, all the way on up to above the last vignette. Okay, so that's a relative calculation from the, from the previous slide. Let's just go back and look at the previous slide, right? All we're doing is we're, is we're saying the respondent gets to decide where these vignettes are. If they're down here, it's a one. If it's equal to this, it's a two. In here, it's a three. Equal to Jane, it's a four. Between Jane and Allison, it's a five. Equal to Allison, it's a six. And above Allison, it's a seven. So you, you code the self-assessment relative to the vignettes, leaving the vignettes fixed, even though, of course, the vignettes, the answers to the vignettes are, are different across respondents, but we assume that the relative ranking is what's meaningful. So this methodology, this non-parametric methodology codes up the relative rankings. Um, well, sometimes there's ties among the vignettes. So for now, let's just uh, apportion the C equally among the tied respondents. This is totally wrong, but we'll, we'll fix that shortly with a cool, non -parametric, a cool parametric addition to the non-parametric methodology. Um, we're going to treat vignette ranking inconsistencies Right? Like, you know, maybe Moses is not at the bottom for some people. They just misinterpret the question and they put Moses above. So we're going to treat those as ties. Um, we can fix that too. Um, we're going to require for now vignettes and self-assessments to be asked of everybody. And it turns out we'll have a parametric method to come that doesn't require us asking the vignettes of everybody, which will save a lot of money in, ask, in asking um, these questions. Because right now, of course, what we're proposing is for every survey question for which there may be interpersonal incomparability, um, the idea here is that we should ask a few vignette questions. And of course, that, that multiplies the cost of the survey. But with the parametric method, we'll be able to ask the vignette questions on on, for, only some of the, um, for only some of the respondents. Okay. So we have to understand what the assumptions are we're making. And these are basic measurement assumptions. Okay. First of all, we have what we're going to call response consistency. So response consistency is that each respondent uses the self-assessment and the vignette response categories in about the same way across, across questions. They understand um, the, the response categories and, they, and they're using them the same way. So diff can occur across respondents. I can view diff things differently than you. But when I look across questions, I answer things in comparable ways. I use the answers, this, the multiple choice answers, in the same way for myself when I do my self-assessment as for Alice and Jane and Moses. Um, second assumption is vignette equivalence. So the actual level, the true level for any vignette um, is the same for all respondents. So the true level of political efficacy for Allison is the same for you and me and for everybody else. That's an assumption. I think it's a reasonable assumption because it is the same Allison and the only thing that we know about Allison is the little paragraph, vi the little vignette that we, that we wrote to describe Allison. Um, <clears throat> Uh, vignette uh, equivalence also assumes uh, that the quantity being estimated, this, this level of efficacy for uh, Allison actually exists, um, and the scale being tapped is unidimensional. Of course, it could be multidimensional. We hope to be tapping a single dimension, but if it's multidimensional, then that, that would violate the assumption. So in other words, we allow response category diff, uh, <clears throat> but assume stem question equivalence. Okay, so now let's compare political efficacy, which is say in government, between Mexico and China. Now, you remember Mexico from, from uh, the slides on um, multinomial logit, right? We, did, we replicated a study uh, using multinomial logit, and um, this, it was the election before um, the, uh, the ruling party, which had been in power for a long time, um, uh, finally um, lost power. Um, so after 70, 71 years, in the, in the election after we analyzed the last, the last time, uh, Vincente Fox was elected president, and he was not from the PRI. He was, he was from uh, an opposition party for the first time, and Mexico had a peaceful transition of power. This is not a perfect democracy, but it is, it is a pretty democratic government. Let's compare Mexico to China. So I needed a graph, I needed a picture to convey China in particular on political efficacy relative to Mexico. So here's my, here's my graph. Uh, how much say do you have in getting government to address issues that interest you? Now, now uh, hang on if you think this is offensive. This guy, this guy's around, okay? 
He, after the, this was uh, Tiananmen Square. After Tiananmen Square, he left China and he was at MIT. So it may be offensive to you that he's at MIT, but that's all. Okay, in any event, my main point is that political efficacy for Mexico is here and political efficacy for China is here, no question. This is my measurement of the truth. That is, we know these two cases, it's perfectly clear Mexico has more efficacy than China. I'm gonna use that result and we're gonna see what we get um, when we analyze the data in different ways. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna use the non-parametric method I just described. Before that, even, I'm just gonna use the observed, the observed values, here's the observed values. So the observed values go from, from no sand government all the way to unlimited sand government. And I have a histogram for Mexico leaning towards the no say end and China leading towards the, the unlimited say end, which is crazy, okay? So the Mex Mexico's in red, China's in yellow, I think actually I should have switched those, but in any event, um, Mexico, uh, so Mexico is leaning towards the no say and in, uh, um, no say in government, no, uh, you know, individual Mexicans report having less say in government than ch the Chinese people report having say in government themselves. Now, just to be clear, when we did a survey, when we did this survey in Mexico, the Mexicans who were answering the question weren't thinking about the Chinese. They weren't saying we have less say than the, than the Chinese. They just reported we, w this is the level of say in government we have. And the, chi and, and, and the Mexicans put themselves about here. And when we asked the Chinese, they weren't thinking about the Mexicans. They might not even have known about the Mexicans. They did, certainly didn't know that we were gonna use their answers to compare to the Mexicans. The Mexicans were here, they put themselves here, the Chinese put themselves here. Now, that's crazy. Not the individual survey responses because they were answering the question they chose to answer. <clears throat> but for the, for, for the purpose of, of a, an analysis, that's crazy. It doesn't make sense. It, it gives the wrong answer and, and I'm defining the right answer by our qualitative assessment uh, in, from the last slide. Now let's look at our non-parametric measure. Our non-parametric measure um, measures the self-assessment only relative to the, to the anchoring vignettes. When you do that, you get this graph. And this graph has the, Ch China, the, the Chinese respondents leaning towards the left no say end and the Mexican respondents leaning towards the unlimited say end. There's more categories here because, the, because of the, the way we constructed this, but clearly it reverses the issue. So the observed value is the Chinese put themselves here and the Mexicans here and the correction goes like this, okay? And let's actually look at this first category. This first category, are people who put Moses suffering in silence. Remember I told you to remember that guy? They're the lowest political efficacy you could sort of imagine that we described. Um, <clears throat> um, people weren't in jail, but they had no say in government. They were suffering in silence, right? That's Moses. 40% of the Chinese respondents in our survey put themselves below Moses suffering in silence, right? We could see that. We could correct for that. This is the correction. This is the, the observed value. It seems like it adds, it adds some value there. The next piece that I want to focus on here is one part that we skipped over, where we said, suppose that the respondent um, just judges Allison and Jane to have the same level of political efficacy, or even takes Moses and puts, puts them on the top. You know, if you actually have experience ask, a, asking survey questions, it's not uncommon to completely blow the survey question. Uh, I, in, in actually these surveys, um, one of the things we did is we asked <coughs> vignettes of people all over the world, and one of the sets of vignettes was, um, uh, was uh, uh, we were measuring health, and, uh, the, and the, we compared someone who ran five kilometers were, with someone who could run 10 kilometers. And all over the world, uh, people judged uh, a hypothetical person who could run 10 kilometers as more healthy than someone could, who could run five kilometers. Of course that's true, except for sub-Saharan Africa. In sub-Saharan Africa, for some reason um, that we couldn't figure out at first, um, uh, people ranked quite un uniformly, ranked someone who could run 10 kilometers 
less healthy than someone who could run five kilometers, right? Everywhere in the world, you run 10 kilometers, you're more healthy than if you can run five, but in sub-Saharan Africa, they switched them. So what the heck, is, what the heck was the story? So we retranslated the questions, we sent them out and we did it again, came back the same way. We translated them, we back translated them, we rephrased the question, came back the same way. We tried everything. And then we finally dispatched some people to sub-Saharan Africa and just sat down with people and said, what the heck's going on? <laughs> like, why do you think somebody who can run five kilometers is less healthy than somebody who could run 10 kilometers? And the reason why is because if you think that you're gonna run 10 kilometers in the Sahara Desert, you're deranged. So there must be something completely wrong with you. And of course, we completely blew that. We weren't thinking that at all. We were writing a question that we thought the entire world would understand. But it's very difficult to write a question that's clear for everybody. In any event, for ranking vignettes, let's suppose there is a clear level of political efficacy that, or whatever the true actual level is that we're trying to measure <clears throat> that applies for Alice and Jane and Moses or all of our vignettes. Um, but sometimes due to random error or due to misinterpretation or due to respondents not paying attention, they take the vignette responses and they tie them or you know, they, they don't perceive the differences that we're conveying, or actually they sometimes give incorrect answers. We're gonna assume that's basically random, but it's still part of the data. It's stuff that we're gonna have to deal with. Okay, so first let me describe a particular way of conveying non-inconsistency and no ties, and then we'll talk about ties, and then we'll show what to do with it. So here's our survey response. Here's, <clears throat> I'm gonna have our survey responses here, and here's some questions I'm asking of the data. And these questions are how I'm gonna resolve the problem. C, uh, based on what, what I'm gonna put over here, C is gonna be our corrected measure, our corrected non-parametric measure. So if Y is less than Z1, that's our first question. Second is Y equal to Z1, is Y between Z1 and Z2, is Y equal to Z2, and is Y higher than Z2, higher than, so that's sort of the way that we would expect things to go. And in the, in the setup here, um, <clears throat> uh, we have scalar responses, by which I mean they give responses consistent with what we would expect. So the first one is Y is less than Z1 and Z2, and Z1 is less than Z2. And so the answers to these questions over here is it just appears here, this is true. And then therefore we're gonna, then the value of C we're gonna assign as a one. In the second case, um, Y is equal to Z1, and Z1 is less than Z2, and so we'll give it a two. And it goes all the way on up. Okay, so that's how the, the five values are assigned with two, with two vignettes. Let's suppose there's ties. Sometimes ties have no effect and sometimes they do. If they, have an, if they have no effect, here's an example where they have no effect. For some reason, let's say Allison and Jane are judged to have the same level of political efficacy, but the, but the respondent gives the self-assessment to be lower than both. In that case, I think we could reasonably um, just give, give it the same answer as we did in the, in the first case up here, and we, we just give it a one. Okay, well, what about this case? What about um, <clears throat> y is equal to z1 is equal to z2, okay? So the self-assessment is the same as both vignettes. So then we have three answers or four answers. We'd like to know where to put the, where to put the question, right? Is it, and we, and we, here, so here's how we do it. Is, z, is y less than z1? The answer is no, because they're equal. So we're good there. Is Y equal to Z1? Well, yeah, it's equal to Z1, so we put a true there. Is Y between Z1 and Z2? Mm, maybe yes, maybe no. It's not entirely clear, right? Is Y equal to Z2? Well, yeah, it's equal to Z2. Is Y greater than Z2? No, no, it's not. So, the, so it looks like there's two answers here, right? And so what we do is instead of coding the response as a one, two, three, four, or five, we code it as a range, as, as category two, category three, and category four. And so we sort of don't know what the answer is, but basically we think of it as the respondent answered somewhere in those. In those. Now, when, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use an ordered probit-like setup to analyze these data. So imagine in ordered probit, instead of ans asking the question, which of these answers would you like, Instead, we're saying 
there's a five answers here. You don't only have to choose one. You can pick any range of answers. You can pick greater than two. You can pick two, three, four, whatever you want. It, has, it can't be disconnected. So that's a reasonable survey question. Um, you might actually wish to answer that survey question. We would need a statistical method to analyze it. We will need the same statistical method we're going to develop here for these types of data, where the outcome sometimes is a scalar and sometimes is a little is a range. Okay, so <clears throat> we went through all the different possibilities here. There's three possibilities for ties, and then there's uh, there's there's all these five different possibilities for inconsistencies, each of which we deal with as a range. And so these are the ranges for the inconsistencies. These are the ranges for the ties. So now we have a dependent variable, which sometimes takes on a value one, you know, a scalar value and sometimes takes on a range. And so we're going to have to figure out how to analyze that. So that's a good opportunity for us to test our skills. Um, and so we're going to take this non-parametric method and add this par a parametric method of an adapted ordered probit model in order to analyze the data so we can get even more efficient results correcting the bias for, uh, for diff. Okay, so a likelihood for scalar or vector responses. And here, here's how it works. <clears throat> um, we're going to define an unobserved variable, y, or we could, we've previously called it y star, but that's fine. y is distributed normal with mean x, beta, and, and uh, variance 1. So it's the stylized normal distribution um, with uh, observation mechanism, because we don't see y, um, uh, for scalar c, the same as ordered probit, right? So, um, uh, so we only see wh you know, which tau's, which thresholds it's between. Right? That's, that's what we actually get to observe. The probability of observing category C, or being between the thresholds, is the same thing as the integral under this normal curve between two of the thresholds. And that's exactly what this integral is doing here. <clears throat> the observation mechanism for a vector valued C works in the same way. Instead of integrating from one tau to the next tau, if you know that there's a range, you just integrate from one tau to the, to the next tau that we know it is, which might not be the next one, it may be the one after, or the one after. Um, so um, that's the whole thing, and you can ask yourself, if you really want to, as a good test of yourself, do you know how to form the likelihood function for an ordered probit where the answers could be scalars or ranges of, of values? Because that's the, that's the model that we built for this case. And again, you could use it for an actual ordered probit kind of setup where you, where you ask uh, that alternative kind of question. Okay. <clears throat> that method works very well. It's available. There's a, there's a software program that, that implements it. Um, so now I'm going to describe a parametric method <clears throat> that's a little more efficient and also enables us to save some money in uh, survey costs because we don't have to ask the vignettes of everybody. Um, at the potential cost of some model dependence, because we're going to have a model, more of a model than we did in the non, the sort of, I'm calling it a non-parametric method, but of course we used a parametric procedure as part of the non-parametric method, but it's mostly non-parametric. This one is fully parametric, and it's a multiple equation model, and the key aspect of it is we're going to have to think about identification. And the vignettes are going to provide the, the, the clue to identification. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so first let me give you some intuition. Um, suppose we added, asked a bad survey question. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm declaring it bad ahead of time um, because there's an easier way of doing it, but I did it to choose an, an intuitive, interesting, and uh, substantively understandable question. So suppose the survey question is, how old are you? And the answers are elderly, middle-aged, young adult, and child. Okay, and so over on the left-hand side, we could think of this as um, the answers you might get in a developing country, or any anybody over 40 might be elderly, etc. And <clears throat> respondent two maybe is from you know the U.S. or the or the West, where you know. Uh, your, your child until you're 25. If you're graduate students here, you, you, you may have spoken to your parents, you know what I mean. Um, you're a young adult, you know, until maybe you're 55, and then middle age to in your 60s until you're 80. You don't get to be elderly until you're over 80, okay? So here's a case in which there's 
there's diff, there's differential item functioning, there's um, different people from different cultures probably interpreting the survey questions, the survey categories, the response categories in different ways. And we're gonna have to deal with this, okay? So how do we deal with this? The tows here are the thresholds between them. So in this developing country respondent, um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, they have a threshold between elderly and middle-aged that's down here, and in this, you know, hypothetical situation that I'm um, making up here, uh, the same tau, tau three, is all the way up here at 80, okay? So, so in this setup, in this uh, parametric model, we're gonna work on correcting diff by adjusting the tau's. That's gonna be the thing that we're gonna focus on. Um, so if thresholds vary, uh, uh, categorical answers are meaningless. That's basically the thing that I think you learned from this, from this slide, unless we can correct the thresholds. So those thresholds, which we've assumed are constant in ordered probit, if they vary across respondents, they can completely mess up everything. Um, so here's a way to think about it. Um, in ordered logit or ordered probit, can we subscript the tau's by person? Could we? Um, another way to think about it is, um, well, because, sorry, the answer to that question, of course, is no, because it's not identified. You, you wouldn't have enough information to estimate all the tau's. Even if you uh, reparameterize the tau's as a function of some explanatory variables, you wouldn't be able to estimate the coefficients on those explanatory variables. So then ask yourself, what information would we need to identify the tau's, right? Well, why are the tau's not identified to begin with? <clears throat> Take a single tau in, 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 um, in binary logit, right? So we have a single tau or two tau's, right? So how do we, how, like, suppose they differ for different people. Well, if, if the tau moves, if the tau's move, and the mean moves in different directions, like we would, like, it's the same thing, right? If the, t if the tau's move this way or the mean moves this way, there's no way of distinguishing the two because the scale is, there's no natural scale, right? We're, we're making up the scale, right? In fact, what we do when we do, when, when you saw the uh, presentation I did on, um, on logit and probit, we set the tau at zero because the tau, even one tau was not identified. So we set it to an arbitrary value and we set the scale of this unobserved variable. It was unobserved, we made it up, so there's no reason we can't just fix something about it. So we fixed the, the first tau. And there's always one of these tau's, if there's a whole bunch of them, like in ordered probit, one of the tau's you fix to zero. Um, so what information would help you identify the tau's? That's what we're gonna use the vignettes for. Okay, and the parametric model will work by estimating the thresholds that vary over the people. Okay, now I'm gonna give you a graphical version of the model, because it's sort of a complicated model, but I can give you the intuition from this graphical setup, okay? So for starters, I built an ordered probit model that is entirely done by, um, by, uh, by this setup. So over here, we have uh, an ordered probit model. So this, is, this straight line is intended to convey um, a deterministic relationship because mu is equal to x beta, so it's linear. Um, and then we're gonna have an unobserved variable, remember it's, it's gonna be ordered probit-like, where mu is gonna lead to uh, y star, but y star is, is unobserved and is randomly generated from a normal distribution with mean mu. And then down here, um, y star is now drawn from the, is, is this unobserved continuous variable. And we go from the y star with a straight line to the y th through the observation mechanism. And it's the tau's that tell us which observed value of little y that we get, right? So that's the setup. Um, so, um, uh, so that's ordered probit, okay? Um, now we're gonna add one little feature. So this is, the, this is the feature that we added, and it is the, the tau's here are now gonna be a function of, of, of some v's. And v's are basically gonna be some explanatory variables that predict the tau's that I told you the coefficients of which are gamma are not identified. So we're gonna have to do something to identify these, right? Not identified, I mean the likelihood function's flat. We can't estimate the effect of the, the v's on the tau's. So what are v's? Let's just back up a step. Well, one v could be 
the country dummy for Mexico versus China. Another V could be gender, because sometimes genders interpret things in different, <clears throat> the, people with different genders interpret things in different ways. Maybe it's, it's race, right? Maybe it's different cultural categories. Um, it depends, obviously, what those, what those things are, but you need, you need to code them in order to, in order to estimate them. <clears throat> but even though this parameterization will allow the tau's to vary, we still need to estimate the tau's by, but through, after the reparameterization, we only need to estimate the gammas, but we can't estimate the gammas because it's not identified. Okay, so let's add a vignette question. The vignette question is also going to be an ordered probit, only it's going to be a simpler one. For starters, the mean value of the vignette of the, uh, of the level of political efficacy for Jane is going to be theta 1, 1 for the first vignette, but it's the same for all people. The same for all people because Jane has the same political efficacy regardless of who we ask it of. <clears throat> then uh, from that, that, that mean, th th we'll have a variance of 1. It's a normal distribution. And we will draw an unobserved continuous variable for the vignette, which we're going to call z. That's the perceived level. We'll go from the actual level to what we're going to call the perceived level. And then we're going to go to the reported level through the thresholds and then, you know, the, and the observation component gives us the z's. Um, you know, again, we'd like those to vary. We're going to let them vary by the same v's as over here. Um, there's an i here for individual i and there's a little l here for individual l. Why are those different? Because we're going to allow those to be different subsamples. They could be the same sample. But the key thing is, the key identifying restriction, the key to the whole model is that gamma here and gamma here are the same. So this is an example from multiple equation models of parametric dependence. The two models here are parametric, the two components of the one model are parametrically dependent because the gamma is the same in both. Okay, what does that mean substantively? It means that if, if race is causing um, blacks and whites and Asians and Hispanics to interpret uh, the survey questions in different ways, then it's causing them to interpret the response categories in different ways, and they're using the response categories the same for the vignettes and the self-assessments according to our assumptions, but the, um, the, the diff is going to be the same for every person across questions, the gammas are the same, even though they may differ across respondents, that's why there's a subscript on the V here and here. Okay, so, that, so this second component, the vignette component of this model, helps identify or enables us to identify the moving tau's here. Okay, I'm going to make this a little bit more complicated, but that's the key part that you, need, that you need to understand. Okay, so that's the main thing. I'm going to dwell on it before I make it more complicated, but let me now make it more complicated. Okay, first we're going to add some more vignettes. So the first thing I did before that was there was only one vignette. But in my qualitative example so far, I've, I've already had several, several vignettes. And obviously, if we only have one vignette, then the non-parametric method can only be greater than, equal to, or less than the vignette. So if you have two vignettes, you get five points, right? And so you get more and more precision on your answer. If, there, if, that's, if that's real information, that would, that's valuables. Similarly with the parametric model. Here we're going to add one vignette, and then there's, you know, this all the way up to J vignettes. Uh, across all of these, the gammas are the same, and the value of the Vs are the same. We're going to ask, you know, if this is gender or race or country, it's going to be the same across all of these. It provides more stronger identification, that is. Okay. In addition, um, we might actually have multiple questions uh, and multiple self-assessment questions. So if there was no problem with interpersonal incomparability, the left-hand side of this model would go away. But we might actually have a measurement model in which we had 10 different questions all trying to measure the same thing. You've all taken standardized tests. That's what they do. You have items, which are, that's where, exactly where that phrase comes from. They're survey, they're not survey questions, but they're test questions, they're test items. Um, and we're trying to measure achievement or intelligence or some other uh, education-like concept. And, uh, and that common number, that common level of achievement or intelligence is supposed to generate 
um, the, the unobserved variables. Um, and then each of the unobserved variables produces an observed variable when it goes through the thresholds. In this model, all the, all the gammas are the same. Okay. Um, then I'm going to add one more level of complexity, um, and that's a random effect, which allows the mu's to actually vary randomly as well. I'm not going to describe that in a lot of detail, uh, except to say that when we're getting to the point of calculating quantities of interest, um, that is very helpful to, to give us more precision. Okay. So now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it in one page, but with the math, just so you can see what the model is. I want you to see what the model is. <coughs> um, there's going to be a self-assessment model component and a vignette model component. The self-assessment component goes over individual's I, and vi the vignette model component goes over, vi over individual's L. Those could be the same, but they could be different. The fact that they're different is actually very useful. You could do the vignettes only in the pretest and the, and the, um, the self-assessment in the more expensive survey that you administer to everybody. Or the vignettes could be administered to subsets of people. Uh, in fact, in practice, we recommend that people, if they're going to use the parametric model, ask the self-assessment of everybody, of course, and then break your sample up into groups of four and ask four vignette questions, one-fourth one of each of the respondents randomly assigned to, the, to those four. <clears throat> In any event, a self-assessment component and a vignette component, we can imagine them for the moment all on the same people. Um, uh, so we're going to have an actual true level, which is mu, that's the thing we want to estimate, which is going to be equal to uh, x beta, x are what the things that, that uh, produce political efficacy or whatever your, your, the actual level of the variable you're trying to measure is, um, <clears throat> plus our random effect. So that's a random effect inside the, um, inside the systematic component. Um, then we're going to have a perceived level. Uh, of, the, of the actual level. So a perceived level, which is going to be the, um, uh, a randomly drawn variable from a normal distribution, mean equal to mu, and mu is the, <coughs> is the actual level. We're going to have variance one, so it's a stylized normal distribution. There's several of them because we have this measurement model and, and allow for that. Um, and then after it goes through the observation mechanism, we get a reported level. So the reported level all that does is you start with the perceived level, the continuous unobserved variable, send it through the tau's, that then produces the categorical outcome. <clears throat> and that's all that says, and it, it just does it for uh, S, different, S different cases. So that's the self-assessment component. By itself, it's not identified. By itself, it wouldn't be very useful. Um, so we're going to add to that a vignette component. Um, sorry, I... I uh, needed to show you this one other step. We, we're going to parameterize the tau's in terms, of, um, in terms of gammas and v's, okay? So just as we had it before. And I have it written here, parameterized in a particular way that guarantees that tau 1 is greater than tau 2 is greater than tau 3 is, you know, so that they stay, they stay ranked in order. Um, and it's a convenient way to parameterize it, okay? Um, so now the vignette component. So the vignette component has actual levels, which are the thetas. The thetas do not have a subscript like the mu's do because Jane has the same level of political efficacy for every person in the sample by our assumption. And the perceived level is for each of the vignettes uh, is uh, drawn from a normal distribution, mean um, uh, theta one and a different and, and, a, and some fixed uh, variance. <clears throat> then there's a uh, reported level by sending the perceived level, the unobserved continuous variable, through the tau's, which is the observation mechanism, to produce, to produce our observed little z's. Um, and we parameterize the tau's in the same way in the vignette component right here as we do for the self-assessment component. And the big connection between the two is that the gammas here are parametrically dependent on the gammas here. The gammas here and the gammas here. They're the parametrically dependent. In this case, they're the same. They're estimated to be the same number. The vignettes enable you to estimate where the tau's are in, in a slightly fancy ordered probit model. So now let's look at some illustrations, <clears throat> um, which are basically going to run the analysis that I've been talking about all along. Um, uh, First one is uh, self-assessments of vision versus medical tests. 
So, so here's the self-assessment. In the last 30 days, and this is, this is actually, uh, we actually administered this all over the world. Um, <clears throat> in the last 30 days, how much difficulty did, you, did Allison have or did you have uh, in seeing and recognizing a person you know across the road, i.e. from a distance of about 20 meters? <clears throat> we did it all around the world. Of course, in the US, we wouldn't say, we wouldn't say 20 meters. Um, but most of the places in the world where we wanted to do this, uh, meters was the thing. Um, and so this, we, you asked the same question for the vignettes and for the, um, uh, and for the self-assessment. Um, and, and the answer is, uh, how much difficulty did you, did you have? None, mild, moderate, severe, extreme, cannot do. Um, the comparison, the, the better way of doing it, we think, is the Snell and I chart. Remember this? You know, you look at the three this way, you look at the, you explain which way the three, the, the E's go. Um, you may have nightmares about that, so my apologies. Um, but, there, but, but that's the, a better way of testing it. And so, but on the other hand, it's actually difficult to test it that way. Now, why? It doesn't seem like that big a deal. Um, as a non-medical person, it seemed pretty easy to me until you figure out what it's like doing this in places uh, through the developing world where lighting is not good, lighting is not constant across different, different places where you're administering it, where there's, there's ne not necessarily an indoor place you can go to do it, where there's dust blowing, <laughs> blowing by, where the, the piece of paper you hold up with the ease is sort of flowing around. You know, I mean, I mean, it's not necessarily the truth. On the other hand, if you spend enough money and really control the environment enough, you can administer the Snellen eye chart test well. So that was our gold standard. That's the, that's the best way of measuring uh, eyesight without um, having to know a language. It's administered to little kids, and it's also administered in lots of different languages. We saw it for the World Health Organization, a simpler, less expensive, and faster way of estimating how well people can see. And so this self-assessment question is our measure. And now we'd like to compare the two, right? So what, is it, what does it look like? Uh, <clears throat> um, so uh, this, do, this doesn't, um, d doesn't change to quantities of interest. There's a special way of getting to quantities of interest, but I'm just gonna show you the specific results. This is the result from the Snell and I chart. And I'm just going to focus on the, the differences in directions. This says the Slovakians see much better than the Chinese. We did this, uh, obviously, in Slovakia and in China. Um, that's the truth, okay? The, the Slovakians actually see much better than the Chinese because the Chinese, at least when we did the survey, really didn't have glasses very much, right? So just because of that, there was a very big difference in how much... Um, uh, how well they could see. So the Slovakians see much better than the Chinese. If you run an ordered probit on the usual situation and you put in a dummy variable for, um, for, uh, for which country you're in, there's no difference here. This is a small coefficient. Um, you, could you can multiply by 0.4 if you want the quick way of interpreting the ordered probit. But it's also uh, much smaller than the standard error, and so there's no real statistical difference from zero. There's essentially no difference between the Chinese and the Slovakians. That makes no sense, okay? We know the truth here. The truth here is because they have glasses, it's a more of a developed country, the Slovakians see much better than the Chinese. And then... We needed a name for the, for the method that I, the parametric method I described to you. Um, and so it was a compound hierarchical ordered probit model. So we called it chop it and we put it in the paper and we sent it to the reviewers and the, the reviewers chopped it. They didn't like the name. So the name didn't survive the paper, but uh, it's in our software. Um, so in the software, uh, chop it, um, uh, the same results, uh, we get the, at least directionally the same results as the Snell and I chart. And after you translate it to quantities of interest, they're, they're put on the same scale. This is not the same scale as this. Okay. Um, obviously, it's better to calculate the quantities of interest, but I didn't want to get into that, which is another uh, issue for these particular models. Um, you can see the model, you can see the articles that explain how to do it. Um, uh, okay, so let's fix a diff in the other example of China and Mexico and political efficacy. <laughs> um, if you run an ordered probit in this model, which is the first column here, 
you find that um, Chinese people have more political efficacy than the Mexicans, which is nuts, right? Chinese put themselves here, the Mexicans put themselves here. If you run Chop It, the Chinese people have less political efficacy than the Mexicans, which we know to be the case, okay? So that's a positive number with um, <clears throat> bigger than the, a lot bigger than the standard error. That's a negative number, also a lot bigger than the standard error. Uh, again, I'm not translating this to the quantity of interest scale, which, which you really should do, and we did substantively in the, in the articles. Um, uh, okay, let me give you another interesting substantive interpretation that you get out of analyzing diff. Again, Mexico and China and political efficacy. So we drew this graph to convey, to convey the story. Um, we have self-assessments, um, <clears throat> which are the, the categorical answer, but we have the observed value, which is the, uh, sorry, we have the, the unobserved continuous value, which is the distribution of Y star for Mexico and the distribution of Y star for China. The mean of those are, as you would expect after the correction, this is Mexico higher than China. And each of these means is estimated quite precisely, although that's not shown here, but Mexico political efficacy is higher than China. What I'm trying to show here is all the features of the model so that you can see what's going on. All right, so first thing is <clears throat> the vignettes are the same for everybody, the Mexicans and the Chinese, the, the Mexican respondents and the Chinese respondents. So theta one is the same throughout. It's a bar because this, uh, it, it conveys the um, confidence interval around it. So we have theta one and theta five, just to give you a feel for it. <clears throat> um, there's, there's other, th we had, obviously we had theta two, three, and four as well. Um, <clears throat> but here's the really interesting thing. Um, well, so, so let's see, those are the vignette assessments. The really interesting thing are the thresholds. So here's the thresholds. This is, these are the distribution of the thresholds. You can look at the mean of each one, right, for Mexico, and the distribution of, the thre of thresholds um, one, two, three, and four for China. <clears throat> um, and the key thing is that the thresholds for Mexico are higher than the thresholds for China. What does that mean? That means that the Chinese have a lower standard for what it means to be a category two and a lower standard for what it means to be a category three. It, they have a lower standard for what it means to have some say in government. And it makes sense, right? Because they're looking at the survey questions and one of the answers is unlimited say in government, right? In China, like how are they supposed to interpret that? I think they look at the scale that's offered them and they think to themselves, the survey researcher is expecting me to use the scale and so they use, they use the scale. Right, they use the whole scale. Um, and the, in order to use the whole scale, the Chinese have to lower their standards for what it means to, to get into these other categories. Okay, so let me just give you a summary. <clears throat> anchoring, anchoring vignettes uh, are used to correct diff, are used to correct interpersonal incomparability across respondents. <clears throat> Not only, but that's a key use of them. The assumptions are response, consistency, and vignette equivalence. Uh, they prob this probably won't, affect, <clears throat> won't eliminate all diff. There's plenty of other misinterpretations people have when they interpret, interpret survey questions. Um, but it's unlikely to make things worse. That's what, that's what we find. Um, <clears throat> you can reduce the, ex the expense if you use the parametric method by assigning each vignette to a subsample, like, uh, you know, have groups of four. Um, if you think you have di diff-free questions, and sometimes I'll give this talk and people will say, oh yeah, yeah, I have no problem at all. You know, and I'm thinking they're, they're reaching for the dinner knife in the middle, in the middle of dinner to fix their heart problem. Um, <clears throat> but you know, now they have the opportunity to really test the hypothesis and we can, we can actually see, please test it this way rather than with the dinner knife. Um, whether or not you have diff, vignettes can help us follow standard advice in making questions concrete. So questions, uh, the best way to ask a survey question is a very, very clear question that everybody understands the same way. It's really difficult to answer, to, to write those questions. We know it's difficult because when we, when we administer them to people, you know, people interpret them in different ways. So they have diff. So, it's v so the, the clearer we can be, the better, and working that out really, really matters. It turns out that the process of writing vignette questions clarifies to the writer, the author of the survey, what you mean by the questions. So it's an incredibly valuable process to go through and write the, vign the vignette questions solely for the purpose of understanding the dimension that you're trying to estimate. Um, uh, that's what it says here. 
Um, so other common survey questions like question wording and accurate translation and question order and sampling design and interview length and the social backgrounds of the interviewer versus the respondent, um, all of those things, they're still gonna, they still may very well be a problem. There's plenty of other problems in survey research that you have to, you have to focus on. Um, but um, vignettes, anchoring vignettes should help at least somewhat in correcting for interpersonal comparability and they'll help you write the questions, and they will help you define concepts, even if you don't administer a survey, um, better than you would without them. So for the National Research Council, we wanted to define privacy. <coughs> in, the, in the information age was the, was the title. The way these National Research Council panels go is they get one person from every walk of life. You know, they get a computer scientist and they get a, they get a philosopher and they get so a privacy advocate. And they, get, they get somebody from, from the tech companies, everybody and me. And they put them all in a room and they say, go write a book, Privacy on the Information Age. Go ahead, you can have any resources you want to go do this. Um, but the key problem that we had was defining what privacy meant. And it turns out there were a whole lot of dimensions of privacy. There was, you know, there was, there was privacy with respect to your data on the web. There's privacy in your home. There was all kinds of dimensions. And then we had to convey not only what the dimensions were, but what it meant to be high and low on that dimension. We didn't necessarily agree what the appropriate threshold was, what an ethical threshold is, and what a legal threshold is for each of the dimensions of privacy. But we saw it to convey at least what the problem was. And so we debated a lot about how to convey this and how to, how to write it. And we would write more and more complicated paragraphs and, and, and chapters about defining what privacy was until we finally realized, wait a second, we can use anchoring vignettes technology to define these concepts that are very difficult to define um, very, very precisely. You know when you see it, but it's, you, know, you don't know it um, uh, unless, you, unless you see it, right? So it's hard to define in theory. So what we did is we said, we're gonna write a set of survey questions. We're not gonna administer the survey, but we're gonna write the survey questions. In particular, we're going to write the vignette questions. And so that's what we did. The, you can look it up. It's uh, cited at the beginning, uh, beginning of this, um, uh, this uh, set of slides. <clears throat> and, it, and what we did is we wrote a set of vignette questions for each of, I don't know, a dozen or so dimensions of privacy. And just the vignette questions themselves help, uh, helped us from many different walks of life who had no reason to particularly disagree. There were privacy advocates, there were people from the, from the tech companies who were essentially trying to violate people's privacy or avoid, avoid defining things so they're, they're violating people's privacy, um, but they wanted information, they benefited from the information. As researchers, I absolutely wanted as much information as I could get about about people without anybody thinking we're violating privacy. So there wasn't a lot of common ground, but there was common ground, eventually we got there, on defining what the different dimensions of privacy was. So it's very helpful, this technique is, to convey what it is you're actually trying to do, um, what it is you're trying to measure. Um, and uh, it at least makes it more precise. The cool thing is you could potentially then go the next step and measure it all. And if people have different ways of interpreting the survey questions, we have a way of correcting that also. So thanks very much for listening. Take care. <laughs>